Hello, I'm Jason, a 47-year-old man. I'd like to share a significant event from my life here and seek some advice. This story takes us back 12 years when I was married to my first wife, Susan. We were together for seven years and had two kids, Laura and Lucas, who were five and three years old at the time. Our life was pretty routine until one unfortunate day. One morning while I was driving to work, a speeding car from the opposite direction crashed into mine. The next thing I knew, I woke up in a hospital bed, covered in bandages and casts. The nurse told me I had been in a coma for two days. I expressed my gratitude to the doctor for saving my life. While I was thankful for a second chance at life, I had no idea about the calamity that awaited me. A week into my treatment, my doctor broke the devastating news that my lower body was paralyzed and I might never walk again. I was devastated. Susan was equally crushed by this news because she had to take care of the household and the kids on her own. I fell into a deep depression, unable to accept my life confined to a wheelchair. My days were spent staring at the hospital room walls, resenting how my life had turned upside down. I mourned the fact that I'd never play soccer with my children, dance with my wife, or experience freedom again. To make matters worse, Susan stopped coming to visit me. Initially, she brought the kids to see me three times a week, and those moments were what I cherished the most. But as time went on, her visits became infrequent. I begged her to bring the children more often, but she claimed they didn't want to see me as frequently. I felt utterly hopeless. Then one day she handed me divorce papers stating, I can't spend my life with a disabled man. I'm still young and want a normal partner. I won't lie, I could feel it coming. I sensed the separation looming when she started giving me the cold shoulder, but I didn't expect it to happen so quickly. About a month after my accident, some friends told me they had seen Susan out and about with a middle-aged man, possibly in his 50s, holding hands at cafes and malls in the evenings and on weekends. Some even suggested she might have been involved with him before my accident, while others thought she turned to him out of desperation afterward. It hadn't even been two months since my accident when I was handed divorce papers. Although I may seem composed writing this now, I was anything but at that time. I was overwhelmed, devastated, and heartbroken. I was confined to a wheelchair, financially struggling, and divorced with no income or savings. After paying for medical bills, household expenses, and the kids' education, saving money was out of the question. Fortunately, my insurance helped cover some of the hospital bills, but I had to dip into my savings to cover the rest. In the end, I had nothing left. I wanted to scream, bang my head against the wall, and curse my luck. I don't know how I held myself together during that time, but something inside me kept me sane. Probably the burning desire for revenge. After leaving the hospital, I moved in with my parents. At 35, I was divorced, had no income, and relied on my elderly mother both physically and financially. My mother worked as a florist running a small shop in the suburbs. The income from the shop and her pension covered her expenses, and she offered to support me with these limited resources. It was incredibly challenging for a 35-year-old man to depend on his 62-year-old mother. Shortly after my release from the hospital, I tried to visit my children. When I arrived at our home, it was locked. The neighbors informed me that Susan had moved to her boyfriend's place with the kids. According to them, Susan's new partner was a wealthy but older man who had been divorced three times and had no children of his own. Some even called Susan a gold digger and accused her of being with the older man for his money. I managed to find her boyfriend's address and went to his house. However, when I arrived at Susan's new home, she refused to let me see my children, claiming that the kids had already adjusted to her boyfriend and were calling him daddy. She warned me that showing up suddenly would confuse the kids even more. When I insisted on seeing my children, she threatened me with a restraining order. I couldn't afford a lawyer, surviving solely on my mother's modest income, so I had to back down. It had been less than six months since my accident and only a few months since our divorce, yet she was already living with another man. I felt disgusted and asked her how she could move on so quickly, though I admit it was immature of me. I was a helpless father in a wheelchair, with few options. I begged her for just one chance to prove my worth, but she degraded me, calling me a burden and a cripple. I inquired if she had cheated on me before the divorce because she was already living with her lover just a month after our divorce was finalized. She dismissed my question, saying it was none of my business and that I should never appear before her again. 
I stared at her, reflecting on our seven years of marriage as she had replaced me so swiftly with someone else. With tears in my eyes, I left, feeling defeated and humiliated. When I returned home, I cried like a child in front of my mother, who comforted me. She encouraged me to take control of my life, but I felt lost and directionless. To begin, I joined my mother in her shop. I assisted my mother with making bouquets, serving customers, and maintaining the shop. It didn't take long for me to realize the business had significant growth potential, but my mother was too fragile to manage it on her own. I used my old contacts to secure contracts with event management companies, providing flowers for their events. Over time, I assembled a team, secured contracts for venue decorations, and eventually launched my own event management company. It took me 12 years to rebuild my life from scratch. Throughout this journey, my mother stood by my side, offering support and encouragement to help me bounce back. A year after my accident, I found out that Susan was leaving the city with my children and her lover. I hurried to their house to see my kids, but they had already left by the time I arrived. Before that, I had made several attempts to reach out to my children, but Susan insulted me and sent me away each time. Susan had full custody of the children and the authority to make decisions for them. Because I was physically and financially challenged, I couldn't pursue joint custody. I couldn't contest her restraining order either, as I couldn't afford a lawyer. Meanwhile, Susan had a wealthy boyfriend named Evan. I didn't know if he had been with her before my accident or how he suddenly entered her life. All I knew was that he was a wealthy man with significant family assets. Over the past 12 years, I made several attempts to meet my children whenever I had leads but faced continuous failure. Susan would threaten to have me arrested, leveraging her boyfriend's money and connections, even though they never got married despite living together for 12 years. A year ago, I finally decided to file for joint custody. I was waiting for my event management business to stabilize before taking this step. I successfully filed for custody and was granted 15 days with my children. They'll be coming to my house next week. Despite Susan's objections in court, I hired a competent lawyer who presented my case effectively, resulting in the 15-day arrangement. My children are now teenagers, aged 17 and 15. They were asked if they wanted to meet me, and they expressed a desire to do so. I understand that I can't make up for the lost 12 years, but I want to spend quality time with them. As the time approaches, I'm feeling a mix of nervousness and excitement. Teenagers can be demanding these days, and I hope my children aren't excessively mean or toxic. I'm unsure about what story Susan has told them over the past 12 years, and I'm debating whether I should tell them the truth about their mother. I'm uncertain. Do any of you have suggestions on how I should approach this? I'm incredibly nervous and excited. Update 1. Hello, everyone. I have some significant news to share. In my initial post, I left out two important pieces of information. First, I'd like you to know about my current wife, Amy. I remarried a lovely woman five years ago, who happens to be an interior designer. We crossed paths at an event where she was handling the wedding venue's design while we were providing the flowers. Love didn't hit us immediately, but we clicked and became friends. We continued to meet at similar events over the next few months and developed a close bond. Amy was a single mother with a three-year-old daughter. The idea of starting our event management company came from her, as she had worked in the industry for years, had the right contacts, and knew the business inside out. I joined forces with her to launch the company. We dated for a year before tying the knot. Now, we live together as a happy family of four. Amy, her daughter Mia, my mother and me. Mia was thrilled to have a grandma, and so was my mother. The second piece of information concerns the compensation for my accident. I was hit by a speeding truck, and in an ideal scenario, the logistics company, which owned the truck, should have compensated me. However, they managed to avoid paying anything at the time by manipulating the facts and blaming me. I couldn't afford a good lawyer then, so I didn't receive any compensation. As you may know, big companies have a way of protecting themselves by hiring expensive lawyers. After my marriage to Amy, she suggested that I reopen the case since we could now afford a competent attorney. The case is still in progress, but my lawyer has given us hope that the judgment will be in our favor. Now let's get back to my story. As I mentioned in my original post three months ago, my children were scheduled to visit me after 12 years of my divorce. I was a mix of excitement and nerves, but Amy provided me with reassurance and support throughout. I went to pick them up at the airport. The older one, Laura, is now 15, and the younger one, Lucas, is 13. 
they've grown into beautiful and handsome teenagers. After the initial greetings, our conversation ran dry, and things got a bit awkward for all three of us. During our ride home from the airport, I tried to break the ice by asking them about school in their city, intentionally avoiding the topic of their mother. They didn't bring her up either. The kids were oddly quiet, maybe waiting for a chance to plug in their earphones, like typical teenagers. When we arrived home, Amy greeted us. The children seemed surprised, as if they didn't expect to see her. I'm not sure why they were taken aback by Amy's presence. If their mother could move in with another man within months of our divorce, why couldn't I remarry? Amy had prepared the guest room for them. We had lunch together, and Amy presented the vacation plans we had prepared for the family. Their reactions were rather neutral. They didn't seem particularly excited, nor did they reject the plans. Amy and I were puzzled by their mixed reactions. They withdrew to their room, and shortly after, I received a call from their mother, Susan, accusing me of manipulating our children. She claimed that I had brought them to my house with Amy to influence them. Her behavior left me feeling disoriented. Susan also accused me of concealing the truth about my marriage. I was taken aback by her allegations, and after hanging up on her persistent calls, I decided to address the issue directly. I called my children and asked them what was bothering them. After some initial hesitation, they opened up. They were angry with me because they were told that I had abandoned them. It turned out that Susan had manipulated the children and filled their heads with lies and deception. I disclosed the whole truth to them. It wasn't me who left. Their mother quickly moved on to another man when the opportunity arose. Even though they were kids at the time, they remembered those events well. I explained how Susan took them to the older man's house and how she had threatened and driven me away whenever I tried to contact them. I showed them the restraining order and all my rejected requests to see them. This revelation brought them to tears, and they regretted believing their mother's lies all these years. My younger son, Lucas, confessed that he once tried to contact me on social media, but Susan discovered it. She emotionally manipulated him and made him promise not to contact me again. The children also revealed that Susan's husband had scolded them. Susan and the children faced mistreatment at family gatherings because they were not married. Susan continued to live as a mistress in his house. Despite covering their education expenses, he never acted as a father figure to them. Hearing about my children's hardships broke my heart. After all the truths came out, we embraced and shared our tears. We went on a week-long vacation in Florida and had a wonderful time together. Laura and Lucas formed bonds with Amy and Mia, who will turn eight this year. Seeing my entire family together made me incredibly happy. My children posted our group photos on social media with the caption, Happy Family. When Susan saw these pictures, she called them and scolded them for their foolish actions. She accused them of betraying her by getting close to us. She texted me, threatening not to let me see my children if I did anything to turn them against her. I chuckled at her empty threats and continued enjoying our vacation. After our vacation, my kids visited my relatives who warmly welcomed them. I was happy to see our old connections rekindled. Before leaving, they promised to stay in touch despite Susan's threats. They mentioned feeling uncomfortable at her place and pledged to live with me after finishing high school. I gave them a hug and said goodbye. When they returned, they talked to Susan about her behavior, but she accused me of turning them against her. It's been a few months since they came back, but we communicate often. I look forward to having them live with me again. Update 2 Hello everyone, I know it's been a while since I last posted an update. There's been a lot of turmoil in the past six months since I first met my kids. Three months ago, we finally resolved the court case with the logistics company. And guess what? I received substantial compensation, not just for the accident, but also for the unfairness in the initial trial. I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but in the first trial, the logistics company that caused the car accident falsely blamed me. As a result, I didn't receive any compensation. I followed my wife's advice and appealed the case, and this time I won. I shared the news with my children, and they were thrilled. They wanted to see me, and I promised to have them permanently back with me. About a month later, Susan unexpectedly showed up at my office. She held my hand and asked for forgiveness. I was surprised by her sudden appearance. She confessed that she had become desperate after my accident. She had connected with an older man who was looking for a companion. I had to look up some terms I didn't know at the time. 
This man had bad experiences with younger women who took his money and left after a few months. So he decided to be with someone not as young, like Susan, who was 32 at the time. Susan had two children, which she saw as a way to ensure her loyalty. The man was upfront about not wanting to marry her and keeping her as his mistress to avoid sharing his inheritance with my kids. Susan agreed to this arrangement because he promised to provide for and support their education. I asked her why she didn't find a job, and she explained that she had never worked before and wasn't sure if she could maintain the same lifestyle her lover provided for free. She kept emphasizing that she was doing everything to secure the children's future. I got frustrated with her constant nagging and raised my voice, telling her that she should have given me a chance to recover if she was genuinely concerned about our children's future. She should have discussed it with me instead of assuming things and leaving me without any notice. I made it clear that I had moved on, and her pleas didn't matter to me. She brought up all the happy moments we had shared, like our wedding day and the birth of our two children. But I brushed them off, saying I had changed, and those memories no longer meant anything to me. She went too far by suggesting that she and my children were my true family, not Amy and Mia. She even claimed that Mia wasn't my daughter and that I could never have a real family with Amy and Mia. I was disgusted by her hurtful words. I firmly told her that I loved Amy and Mia, and they were my true family, not her. She caused a scene in my office and refused to leave until I warned her about involving the police. After that, I went home and told my mother and Amy about it. Amy was naturally upset, but she handled it maturely and didn't make a big deal out of it. My mother mentioned that she never liked Susan because of her selfishness. Mom even suggested that Susan had only come back to me because of the money I received from the court settlement. She called her a gold digger. When my kids found out about their mother's behavior, they scolded her and told her to stay out of our business. I'm not sure how her sugar daddy found out about this incident, but he threatened to cut ties with her if she tried to contact me again. I couldn't be more grateful to him. The latest news is that my children will move in with me this month. They'll stay with us briefly before I enroll them in a nearby college. They want to experience college life and live in a dorm. I believe it's important to stay connected but also give ourselves some space to get to know each other. Story 2 I, 37-year-old man, was married to my ex-wife, 35-year-old woman, for 10 years when she was diagnosed with cancer at 33, stage 1 breast cancer. She had a tough time, but after surgery, she recovered. I took time off work to care for her and was by her side the entire time as we had moved away from our family. I noticed that she changed a lot, which was expected after going through such a major ordeal. She wanted more from life than just a nine, five job. So she decided to quit and travel for a while, doing whatever she pleased. Initially, I joined her because I wanted her to be happy and it reminded me of her younger self. However, her new lifestyle quickly drained our savings. So I went back to work and essentially funded her new way of life. Even though it was tiring, I didn't mind much because I loved her. Seeing her so happy and full of life after everything she had been through was enough for me. However, one day I overheard her talking to a friend on the phone, expressing dissatisfaction with just me and a desire to be with other people. I was shocked and didn't know how to react, especially since our intimate life had become more active during that time. It was painful to hear her say that. That evening she brought up the idea of having an open marriage. By that point I had time to think, and I realized I couldn't agree to that. She explained that I was her first boyfriend, and she had never been with anyone else before me. We met in high school, so she wanted to experience other relationships. I clearly told her that I couldn't accept it. We argued for a while, but eventually she said she wouldn't pursue it and apologized. However, she lied, and I caught her a couple of weeks later. As a result, we got divorced. It was a difficult process, and I felt completely shattered throughout it, taking me a long time to heal. I couldn't believe that after everything we had been through, she could do that to us and end our 10-year marriage. It's been nearly two years since the divorce, and yesterday she got in touch through a friend asking to meet up. I was hesitant, but agreed. Seeing her again today stirred up a lot of emotions. We engaged in some small talk, and then she asked if I was seeing anyone. I told her I wasn't, and that's when she began to express that divorcing me was the biggest regret of her life. She went through a tough time after our separation and tried to fill the void I left by seeing multiple other people, but nothing seemed to work. Then she dropped a bombshell. She wants us to get back together. Apparently, she had been inquiring about me before this meeting, 
and when she learned I hadn't been with anyone since our divorce, she assumed I felt the same way. I left feeling bewildered, telling her I needed time to think. I'm genuinely unsure about what to do because a part of me wants to believe she did all those things because of the hardships she faced. But at the same time, I don't think that's a valid excuse. Should I give her a chance to explain herself before making a decision? I feel like I walked out on her before she could clarify things. Update. I didn't expect so many people to respond. Long story short, she found out about my post because she's an active user of this subreddit, and the timing made it clear it was me. I woke up to a message from her this morning. She mentioned that she saw it and was sorry. She claimed that reading what I wrote gave her some insight into my perspective. However, the truth is, she didn't fully understand. What I shared here is only a small part of what I felt and went through, so she can never truly comprehend it. She also acknowledged that dealing with cancer is a life-changing experience, and she expressed eternal gratitude for my support during that time. The whole ordeal terrified her and transformed her as a person. One day, waking up next to a stranger, she realized she had become someone she didn't recognize. She became aware of her mistakes and regrets. Initially, she hesitated to reach out to me because she knew it would be selfish. But later, she decided not to live with the regret of never trying in case there was a chance I might forgive her. She's willing to wait indefinitely if it means there's a possibility of my forgiveness. She also inquired about why I hadn't been with anyone else since her, which many of you also mentioned. To be honest, I didn't actively pursue other relationships because I didn't want to bring all this emotional baggage into a new one, especially before I had tried to work through my own issues. I feel like this is a good way for me to find closure. After reading many of your responses, I understand that I may never forget what she did, but I do want to find a way to forgive her as a means of moving forward. I communicated all of this to her before sharing it here. Story 3 I, 37-year-old man, and my ex-wife, 32-year-old woman, were married for seven years. We were deeply in love, and I never thought I'd share my heartbreak story here. My wife and I used to be colleagues at work. Before my transfer, we both worked at the same company and were pretty close, but our bond grew stronger after I was transferred to lead a new branch of our company in a different state. She was one of the smartest workers we had, which attracted me to her. When we worked in the same office, I didn't have any romantic feelings for her. I just knew I liked her, and we used to talk regularly. However, weeks after my transfer, I can't explain how it happened, but I found myself talking to her every day. We continued this way for months until I asked her out. Since she already had feelings for me, she didn't need to ponder my proposal like some other people might. She simply said yes, and we dated for two years before getting married. Within two years, I quit my job at the company I was working for. There was an incident that led to my departure. But fortunately, I quickly found another job in our state after leaving the previous office, and I moved back. This second job was much better than the first, but the downside was that it required regular travel. In the first year of our marriage, my wife and I had a daughter, and in the fourth year she gave birth to a son. Becoming a father was one of the best things that ever happened to me, and I made many sacrifices to ensure my wife and kids had a comfortable life. My wife was also a hard worker, and together we teamed up to raise our two beautiful children. We hardly had any problems, and even when we did, they were nothing we couldn't resolve. Besides being a good father, I did my best to be a good husband as well, occasionally treating my wife to special dinners or whatever she desired. Most of the time, we would send the kids to her mother's house and spend the entire weekend together. We did these things occasionally because I didn't want us to get so caught up in making a living that we forgot to enjoy our marriage as we grew older. We also made an effort to go on vacation every year, even if it was just for a week. I'm sharing all of this to illustrate that I played my part in being a good husband, treating my wife like a queen with all the things I did for her and our kids. I never expected her to stoop so low to do what she did. Even though I knew she earned a decent income, we split the bills 60, 40. I took care of most things. And if anyone made the most sacrifices during our seven-year marriage, it was me. I supported her through both good and tough times, including when she had issues with her mother for two years, during which she didn't let her mother see the kids. I did everything I could to support her. If she wanted something that I wasn't comfortable with, whether it was too expensive or unnecessary, I'd still do it to make her happy. All this time, I thought I was doing what any husband would do for his wife and family, but I had no idea I was wasting my time. 
I wouldn't have even known my wife was cheating on me if things hadn't unfolded the way they did. On that day, I had a very important business trip scheduled. However, my clients canceled it on the same day. Since I had been traveling extensively, I had limited time to spend with my kids. Earlier in the day, my wife and I agreed that I would drop the kids off at her mother's house because I had to pass through that area to reach the airport. But when the meeting was canceled just two hours before my departure, I decided not to take the kids there so I could spend time with them. We played various games together, and it was a lot of fun. During our playtime, I made a deal with the kids that if they could catch me in our game of tag, I would treat them to ice cream. Giving them ice cream meant breaking their mother's rule of having ice cream only twice a day. But we promised not to tell anyone about it. While the kids were enjoying their ice cream, I noticed them whispering to each other. When I asked what they were talking about, they made me promise not to tell my wife. I was curious, so I agreed not to spill the beans. To my astonishment, the kids revealed that my wife had a secret friend. Whenever I traveled for a business trip, she would invite this secret friend over to pretend to be their dad until I returned. They even provided details, explaining that my wife's secret friend would stay overnight in our room with her. If I was coming home on a specific day, the friend would leave early in the morning. I was certain they hadn't made this up because it wasn't the kind of story kids could fabricate. They shared it with me because my wife's secret friend would also secretly give them ice cream, and they all promised not to tell their mom about it. I was furious to learn that a stranger was coming into my home to take care of my kids, and my wife allowed it. To prevent revealing what I had discovered, I asked my kids to keep it a secret from their mom, and they agreed not to say anything. Later that evening, when my wife returned, 